Good morning, friends. I welcome you to this time of celebrating the life of Lyle Herman Van Horn. We are here to celebrate his life and worship God, his creator, who gave him life. He gave him the will to persevere, and he gave him, him the hope that someday, somewhere, all things will be set right. In a time and a place where pain gains no entrance, limitations hold no one back, and troubles are never known. After 75 years of loving, pain-filled service to God and his family, God, in his infinite wisdom, decided to set Lyle free from the constraints of his earthly body. The increasing pain, the weakened body, and the limited movement gave way to the ever-compassionate healing plan of the Father. The tilted, altered body, the slow, intentional movements, and the deep sighs of exhaustion ceased to exist on Monday night. As his spirit eased from the form that we knew as Lyle, the real Lyle broke forth in triumph. Without a, with a praise, with a shout of praise that was on a frequency that we can't hear, and with a hallelujah that we can't yet understand, the broken became the healed, the restrained became the free, and the struggling became the celebrating. It is with deep sorrow and unspeakable joy that we come to this place. Lyle is where he longed to be, outside the bounds of, his, of earth's control of his body and into the sweet healing arms of Jesus. Would you join me in prayer as we invite God to take his proper place in your heart and in mine as we worship him today? Heavenly Father, Time changes everything. Given enough time, what is thought to be mighty, unbreakable, and unstoppable becomes weak, shattered, and immobile. But in that same crucible of time, the weak becomes strong, the shattered becomes impenetrable, and the immobile takes on a life and energy that only eternity can absorb. So it was in Lyle's life. He has now been released from this world into your eternal presence where all things are new for him, where strength has been returned, where pain is gone, questions are answered, and the answers are complete. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his continual testimony of how good you were to him. His praise of you was constant. His desire to see you grew with each passing day. And his welcome home was something he wanted for a long time now. Thank you for being faithful to him in death as you were faithful to him in life. His life has been a testament to the call you have upon humanity to serve you no matter the circumstances, to love you no matter the distractions, and to honor you no matter the hardships. Thank you, Father, for the amazing work you did in Lyle's heart and mine. We pray for the family today. Marilyn loved him with an ever-growing fondness and love. The boys, Mark, Andrew, and Daniel, admired him as their hometown hero. The grandkids wondered at the mystery of what made him who he was, and all of them loved him dearly. Would you be especially close to them today? Reassure Marilyn that her job is to be here just a bit longer, to be a faithful witness to days gone by, and a testimony that a life well lived for the Savior is worth it. Once her days are fulfilled here, she too will be with you, and once again with the other love of her life, Lyle. Comfort the boys as well. Give them the resolve to live every day with the grit and determination it takes to live well, and to serve you no matter what. May the legacy of their daddy live on in them to the degree that their witness and their love for you outshines his. That is what he would want. And may they know that the result, may he know that the result of his legacy is greater 
than him or what he could ever imagine. For the grandchildren, I pray for a blessing that paves the road for generations to come. Generations who continue to serve you, who circle the globe sharing the good news of Jesus, and only rest when they, like Lau, hear those good and sacred words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome into the joy of your Lord. As we worship you today, Father, would you visit the heart and spirit of each family member and friend. Encourage them with the knowledge that Lyle's life is just now really beginning. And just as you have prepared a place for him, you also are preparing a place for all who have placed their trust in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm his sister, Kathleen, and I get to read his obituary to you, so it is with great honor that I do that. Born into an Army Air Force family at West Point, March 10th, 1948, Lyle Herman Van Horn got to fly away like he'd always wanted, suddenly on May 8th, 2023. He was 75. He died at home with his wife and family in Wilmore, Kentucky, after a quiet evening on the patio, listening to the rain, and watching the embers of a fire with a close friend of nearly 30 years. A childhood survivor of polio epidemic, the early 1950s, uh, his life was marked by a struggle against disease, the disease's neurological and physical harms. His right leg was two inches shorter than his left, and he underwent a hip fusion in, early, in his early teens. Over the decades, he had serious uh, a series of hip and knee surgeries that left him painfully scarred uh, with, with scar tissue. His limp and his gait strained and uh, pain, his back muscles. His fondest desire when he got to heaven was to run down the streets of gold with no pain. Hallelujah. Anyway, uh, his parents, John and Sally, did not let polio become debilitating, and Lyle learned about grit from his mother and father, and they cultivated a love of the outdoors in Lyle. He joined the Boy Scouts and achieved the rank of Life Scout, being prevented from Eagle Scout because they had no accommodations for the disability at the time. He did a lot of camping on his own with his own family, Mark and Andrew and Daniel, and have great memories of putting canoes into rivers and fishing. He took each boy on a hunting trip, but since he wasn't able to physically capable uh, being s of sitting in a tree for uh, a tree stand for hours, he outsourced that part of parenting to a close friend and pastor. When camping got too painful, they went to cottages across Kentucky in the Smoky Mountains and Michigan. Lyle's love of the outdoors had its fullest expression when he lived in Alaska. Besides Wilmore, Kentucky, his most favorite place in all the world was Juneau. He lived with his most physically active life there. He hiked, he fished for salmon and Arctic char in the sparkling bays and streams. He caught stories, released them over and over again to his boys. When he wasn't fishing, he worked as an air traffic controller. And when he wasn't working or fishing, he was a faithful congregant at church. It was at the church Bible study he heard about this cute redhead who was looking for a husband at Echo Ranch Bible Camp. And that is how he met Marilyn, his wife of 44 years. Um, in Juneau, he, he fell in love for the first time. He always told us boys he spent every dime courting mom. But we don't think it was all the nice meals and eating out that really made mom fall for dad. It wasn't until we traveled to Juneau for a family reunion and saw Dad had to limp a mile and a half around Echo Bay along a rocky shore to get to Echo Ranch Bible Camp. And then after spending time with Marilyn, Marilyn he would limp back the same treacherous path in the dark that we understood it was really the hike that did it. His willingness to preserve, to grit, his, uh, to grit teeth, and to suffer for some, someone else, to suffer for love. 
Lyle loved to dabble, to explore novel things, and collect hobbies, to pick up something new, put it down, and come back to it years later like a pack rat. Around his home and his easy chair, there were many such piles of interest. A standing bench for a bullet reloading in the uh, laundry room, which Marilyn can't wait to give to one of the boys. Dozens of rainbow post-it noted books on chess tactics and opening moves. At least six different chess boards within arm's reach. Piles of wood in a heap in the basement because he was going to get around to finishing carving those chess peaches, uh, pay, uh, yeah, pieces, uh, sketch pads, paint brushes, watercolors, muzzle loading, photography, video cameras, archery, fly tying equipment, Avalon Hill war games, bench shooting, go, mahjong, model trains, sets, and engines. He wrote one book about faith and science for his sons and always had stacks of books about thrillers, uh, thrillers about spies, history, and books about wars and airplanes, theology books about science, and of course the books that he couldn't remember that he had already read many times. Um, he was not the kind of person who worried about whether he was good at a hobby, but rather whether he enjoyed it. His uh, peripatetic working and education were the same. Pipe fitter, National Park Service employee, anthropology student, archaeology photographer, air traffic controller, FAA security specialist, and logistician. Software tech support, Bible student, seminary student, and his most important professional work, planting and pastoring a Pentecostal church in the tough working class mill town of central Maine. He taught Sunday school and hosted Bible studies. When he was a student at Asbury Theological Seminary, he befriended professors and fellow students and helped them understand the new tools of um, com like personal computers. Bob Bickett, a missionary and student at the seminary, bought Lyle a carved eagle back from the Philippines and in appreciation for his support, helping him with his dissertation. Lyle felt called to Africa, but since his body prevented him from going there, he felt that it was God who brought Africa to Wilmore. And he spent time with African seminary students polishing their theology papers. He prayed for his family, community, and he meditated on things of men, uh, things of God. And he was a very kind man. verse I'm going to be reading is Isaiah 40, 30. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. During my university's Thanksgiving holiday, and a month before my 20th birthday, I walked through the front door of our home after evening service in the sanctuary. I said hi to my dad, sitting in his chair by the corner. I made a cup of Earl Grey tea. I sat down in the rocker across from him and announced that I knew the woman I was going to marry. He looked up from his book and, and he said, and who is she? And I said, Anna Marie Underwood. And he nodded and said, she's a kind and a good and a beautiful woman and she'll keep you grounded in the thanks of God, which was some of the truest and some of the best advice he ever gave me. About 10 years, two kids and three combat tours later, he was sitting in a different easy chair, but in the same corner underneath Duke the Deer, and I'd come back from Afghanistan. I was bitter, I was hurt, and I was angry, I was disappointed. 
I was frustrated with myself. I was disillusioned in my career. And I don't remember what we were talking about. Maybe it was about the church, about God, about marriage, about the injustice of life. Whatever the conversation topic was, it was serious. What I remember more than anything else is the emotion of that moment, this outpouring of pain. And I think in the timber of what I had said, I had lashed out, lashed out in anger. Dad was silent for a little while, then he challenged me. He said, you're not going to be happy until you've learned to accept yourself. And those words had hit me in the gut. I didn't know what to do with them. At the time, I didn't think he had understood me, that he hadn't heard me, and I was annoyed. But how hard it must have been for Dad to grow up. You know, the United States didn't talk about differently abled people in the 1950s or 60s, but rather you could still refer to someone as a cripple or a gimp. There was no American with Disabilities Act to normalize how society treats people with physical impairment. So he had learned about loving yourself as yourself from years of struggle. And, and there he was, passing on a pearl of that hard-earned wisdom to his son who had passed through a valley of the shadow of death and had come back home. You know, so for 10 years, two kids and a retirement later, I've been coming to terms with that myself, learning to love me as God loves me, and in that love, loving other people. And that is what being the world's greatest dad is really all about. Just up the road from Dad's church in Maine was a little ice cream shop. I remember stopping by there many times over and grabbing ice cream with the family, and, and they had picnic tables. And they also had this, this bug zapper. Y'all probably know the big blue light bug you know. And I remember sitting out there many evenings uh, eating ice cream and hearing bugs get zapped. It was tremendous fun. But on, on a picnic table they had out there by that was the uh, Androscoggin River. And you could sit there, eat ice cream, and just watch the river flow by. It was fantastic, memorable times. And as I thought through what I wanted to say, the idea kept coming back to me that uh, one of my fondest memories, really one of the best life lessons that I learned from Dad was the ability to sit there and sit there quietly and just enjoy sitting there. And as Dad had said more many times over, uh, you know, I'd walk in and say, Dad, what are you up to? He goes, oh, just sitting here watching the world go by, <laughs> you know. And there's a lost art to that. We get busy and distracted, and there's a lot of things that go on that we fill our lives with. And yeah, that's what I always remember about Dad was just sitting there, watching the world go by. Many times I'd go visit Dad, and Dad would be in his corner, as Mark had mentioned. And I'd usually sit in the rocking chair, because I love a good rocking chair, on the uh, side there. And the rocking chair gave the best view of the bird feeder that I had bought for Mom on a Mother's Day, I think it was. And... I could sit there in that rocking chair. I could watch the birds hit the bird feeder. I could watch the squirrels run up and down the tree of the neighbor's house. And Dad and I could sit and eat ice cream sandwiches and just kind of sit and watch the world go by. One of the biggest things I loved is Dad's instilled in me a great sense of paddling. What I love about paddling canoes and kayaks and things like that is you get to sit and watch the world go by. You know, there's nothing more peaceful and more relaxing than just Sitting in the now, being present with where you are, being present with who you're with. You don't even have to talk. You can just be. And that, to me, is the most valuable lesson I've learned from Dad. In pain and sorrow and everything else, it's the present that matters the most. It's the present that allows you to just sit and enjoy. When you can sit and watch the world pass by, which is a skill in and of itself. You don't need to worry about what the future has in store for you, because the future will sort itself out. You don't need to worry about the past because that got you where you are now, but in the end doesn't really matter anymore. And it's just that present that I enjoy the most about Dad and sitting in the present and the now and watching the world go by.
All of us can probably recall a phrase that our parents would use, particularly during an argument, that to this day drives us crazy whenever we hear it. My father was no exception to this. Now I loved and still love playing with Legos. And like clockwork, I would be finishing up a masterpiece upstairs and from the living room down below, my father would yell, Daniel, mama's on her way home, clean the kitchen. <laughs> Do you know how frustrating it is to stop building Legos to clean the kitchen? <laughs> Even more upsetting is that it always felt like I was the only one doing it. <laughs> my two older brothers, my two older goofball brothers, always seemed to have dad's timing down to an art and would disappear like ghosts five minutes before dad's declaration every evening, leaving me to do the deed. Now, of course, my brothers cleaned the kitchen as well and did other chores, but don't tell them I acknowledge that because it ruins my points. <laughs> In my anger, I would bring this up to my dad. And can you guess the phrase that he would say? Life is not fair. Ooh, that drives me crazy to this day. You know why? Because there's no good comeback. Life is not fair, Daniel. Uh, uh, but, um, all right. And I'd start doing the dishes. And to this day, and you can ask my wife, she'll verify this, I hate doing the dishes. <laughs> now, I do clean the dishes because I'm an adult and that is expected. Well, I, I do leave the pan sometimes. <laughs> but I still refuse to say, however, the phrase, life is not fair. Today, I make an exception to that rule. About a month ago, I was watching video clips on YouTube and came across a clip from the front lines of Ukraine. This clip was from a drone hovering at perhaps 500 feet. The camera was zoomed out to the ground below, which looked as if it was straight out of a World War II history book. It was an overcast day, not unlike Kentucky's weather. And what few trees were there had no leaves and looked mangled and lifeless. Trenches zigzagged the ground and debris was littered everywhere. Suddenly, bright yellow streaks of light fly across like lasers straight out of some sci-fi movie. These were tracers, which are bullets that burn as they fly through the air. The camera angle shifts slightly to a Russian tank firing its machine gun at a small foxhole. And inside that foxhole is a Ukrainian soldier, a lone Ukrainian soldier, who is returning fire using his AK-47. The much larger Russian bullets are impacting mere inches from his head, kicking up dirt and debris. The soldier empties his rifle, calmly reloads, and continues to fire at the tank. The video fades to black. Now, this is a short clip. It's only about 30 seconds. And I don't know why I watched it or why it popped up in my YouTube feed, but I watched it. Now, can you imagine the fear, adrenaline, and acceptance that that soldier had that his life was likely seconds away from ending? Talk about courage. Some might cower in fear, others would try and surrender, but this lone soldier fought. Whoever he was, I hope that he received his country's highest honor for the sacrifice, grit, and determination to keep fighting this much larger foe in defense of his country. What an example. Life is not fair, is it? My father's fight with chronic pain was his intimate and constant battle. Why do some people have it harder than others? Only God will ever know that answer. But what sets my father apart, just like that lone soldier fighting for his life, is attitude. Despite the constant pain, he would constantly pray for others, write uplifting emails. Some of them didn't make sense to me, but that's another story. He would send texts and never miss a beat, reminding us how lucky he was to have found and married my mom in Alaska. To my father, his pain was temporary, and heaven eternal. He made the most of his life, life despite those circumstances, passing on a love for art, the outdoors, fishing, and hunting to me. His positive, his positive attitude is a testament to his faith, faith and legacy I will cherish whenever I think about him. As I reflect on Lyle and our memories, 
One of my most precious memories, which I really did not appreciate until now, that it is over. If I could just have one more night where he would come to bed, always needing to sleep on his left side, and I could pat his flannel pajamas and his belly, and he would wrap his arm on my arm, and he would pray for the family, for the grandchildren. He would give, always give thanks to God for our family, for me, for our marriage, that he found me, God's presence in our life, all, all blessings. And he was always giving thanks in all things, which is what the Bible says. He was always grateful, appreciative, complimentary to me and about me, and even though I could be, you know, not always nice. And, you know, he could always see the good. He, he sounds wonderful, but he, he could be irritable and he could <laughs> aggravate us. You know, we, we all know that. <laughs> but you know what? I wish I had one more time to hear his prayer and to tell him I love him.
Oh, Marilyn, I am so sorry to hear this, but I can only imagine how joyful he must be to meet Jesus in glory. He was such a huge influence for me as I grew in faith and love of my Lord and Savior. I wish I could share with you a few stories. Without the lessons and knowledge that Lyle taught in his sermons, I wouldn't have the courage and the assurance to stand strong in my faith. My thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. I love you all. Mary Ellen. A voice from the past, giving a testimony in the present. She was one of many people who walked into a new relationship with Christ under Lyle's pastoral ministry. She did it because this guy, who was damaged goods by much of the world's standards, dared to be bold. He dared to forego the pain. He dared to take a risk that few who are capable dare to take, planning a church in the religiously cold Northeast, no less. He dared to allow himself to be fully used by Christ for all of Christ's purposes, pain, limp, limitations, and all. It's sad but true that as years pass, the impact one's life has made tends to be lost to the new friends they make. The stories of life now are different from life then. Many of us never witnessed firsthand the dedication, the grit, and the determination Lyle had. It's captured in that story as he trudged the rocky shores of the bay to find and to be with the love of his life. We knew that life was tough, and we knew he was tough. But we didn't know he was that tough. And we never really understood the dedication, the grit, and the determination he had to trudge along the rocky shores of life to find the Lord of his life, to be with the Lord of his life, and to share his love for him with others. But there were those who have witnessed it, just like Mary Ellen, who wrote that note to Marilyn. They have seen it lived out in front of them for their benefit and for the benefit of Christ's kingdom. Although it may have gone unnoticed by many in this world, it wasn't unnoticed by the one outside of this world. And may I reassure you that someday we will meet all of them in heaven. Lao's life is a testimony of God's ability to work powerfully through human frailty if we allow him to do so. In life, Lyle walked in the midst of the greats, and now in death, he does even more so. Along with the Apostle Paul, Lyle lived out the words found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My life is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will only boast about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing it. I will boast about my, I, because I will be telling the truth. But I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me the credit, and credit beyond what they can see in my life. I want them to hear my message. So to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged, and I'm sure Lau probably begged the Lord more than three times. Lord, take it away from me. And each time he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power works in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take my pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. 
For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul put into words the testimony of Lyle's life and his love and service for the Lord. It seems at times that those that stand the tallest among us get lost in the crowd. Those who fight most valiantly are never noticed in the fray of war. Those who struggle the hardest get passed over by mundane, everyday challenges. Those whose pain is the most severe get forgotten because the sudden shocks of our personal pain demand all of our attention. And those whose stories are most poignant become lost as time robs the memory from our minds and new memories take their place. But friends, today we celebrate a life lived valiantly for Christ. In spite of the pain, in spite of the limitations, in spite of little to no recognition, Lyle courageously, confidently, and continually took on the challenges of life. He took on the cross of Christ, even the thorn in the flesh, so that Jesus could be glorified, so that souls could be saved, and so people could have a personal relationship with Jesus. Lyle's life is a witness to what the power of God can do through a willing vessel, no matter how broken the vessel appears on the outside. So my brother Lyle, on behalf of your colleagues in ministry who serve alongside of you, on behalf of the Church of Christ whom you faithfully served, and on behalf of the entire Bride of Christ who commends you, we give God all the glory for the good work that you allowed him to do in you and do through you. To him be all glory and praise because the good work he has started in you, he has now completed. Amen. Uh, a couple years ago, I realized that Lyle was getting worse. And I thought, I'm going to commit myself to seeing him once every week. And we'd get together, and sometimes the pain level would be two, and we'd have some great discussions, you know, about philosophy, theology, things, you know, archaeology, everything. And some days he would be at pain level five, and he would start remembering about it. <laughs> He would um, reminisce about his childhood in England, his farm life, and it, it seemed like that this recollection would ease his pain. <laughs> he, his pain. So, and sometimes we get some great discussions, and sometimes they get heated. And if you disagree with the man, his eyes would like. And he said one time, he said, uh, Daniel said about. Life is unfair. And I said, well, well, I said, Lyle, but we as Christians are to be fair. And he eyes look up like, you can't disagree with me. <laughs> and um, sometimes it gets so heated, Marilyn would be in the kitchen. And um, she'd go, guys, would you settle down? And we'd be like fist pumping each other like we were getting into it, you know. And this was gone for two years. But the last day, this past Monday, was like no other. There was that peace. Like it was just, Marilyn was fluttering around, working on her garden. She would sit down. But he kept saying, man, it's what a great day. I feel so good. It's nice to be here. And um, one time, and then Marilyn would sit down and get up, sit down and get up. You know how she is, <laughs> fluttering, fluttering. She sat down and, she, and, and then, she looked at him with such love. It was just a submission of intensity. It was just purity. It was like it kind of took me back. It was like, whoa. And you saw this real abiding love. He could, like, the, what is it? The, uh, the eyes or the windows to the soul. And it was like, man, it was like something I'll never forget. And so she went in the kitchen and cooked some meatloaf and, um, 
the fire went out, we went back into the um, living room. And for a whole, but usually we're always talking about something, but there was just silence for the whole afternoon. We were just very quiet, very peaceful. And I thought, this is very unusual, very unusual. And um, so I finally get up and go, and I get into my truck, and I, it was almost like a, I had to stop for a second, it was like a spiritual intoxication. It was like, wow, what a day. You know, you know when, you, when you're so used to seeing the pain or whatever, he was just so calm, peaceful, pain-free. And I got home that night, and, and Andrew texted me, Dad has passed away. And I was going, wow. Was just like, I was, you know, I would expect that if he was in pain all day, and then he passes away, that I could see that. But this was just the opposite. And, um, and something hit me. I was thinking about Martin Luther King. In his famous speech, he said, uh, there's this, this old Negro spiritual that uh, says, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, Lyle is free from pain at last. There are many books written about living well, books about um, eating well, books about investing well, but very few books about how to suffer well, which is as crowd as that means to carry our, how do we carry our cross? And, and Lyle and Maryland, you know, taught me, well, actually showed me how to carry your cross, not just daily, not just for three days, not for a month, but for a year and a year and year out with a peace that passes all understanding. That's... I met Lyle 23 years ago when I moved on to Asbury Drive. And that was as his life was starting to shrink a little bit. And he invited me into that life, invited my family in as my family grew. And, you know, at first I thought, well, this is a nice neighbor. Yeah, you know, it's a good friend. But then as I got to know him and, and as I spent more time with him, I realized just how rich that life was that he invited me into. And, it, you know, I'm so grateful that he had the experiences he had before that to draw from because Lyle was full of life. He enjoyed anything new, any challenge. You, you know, if it was... Let's just say he had many, many interests. Uh, he didn't quite have ADD, but he was easily distractible. <laughs> it, he, he, uh, if, if you brought something new to him, it was exciting. Lyle was also a deeply spiritual man, uh, and, and I learned a lot from him. We've heard about his suffering. I've witnessed that firsthand. I've seen the bad days. I've seen the good days. But I saw that no matter what the days were like, what was important to him and how he loved people and how he cared for people, how he put other things first. And, you know, one of his greatest triumphs in life was getting Marilyn to say yes. <laughs> how many times did he ask Marilyn? 27 <laughs> He asked her 27 times to marry him. <laughs> And right up till the end, he would still talk like that was his greatest victory. <laughs> he persevered. Because Lyle wanted a challenge. He didn't want to just sit still and, and read a book. He liked to read, but you know he didn't want a quiet life. And he got a feisty redhead. And that, that was his dream, and that was his, his joy. And, and it just thrilled him. And, and Marilyn, I can't tell you how many times you would be off on a trip or at work or whatever. I'd be talking to Lyle, and he'd be talking about you. 
<laughs> it's great to see a love story like that and that he was able to have that. You know, I, I said he was a spiritual man. One of the evidence of that is he lived out so many things that were taught. So many things that were taught are good and that we're supposed to be like as we imitate Christ. Okay. And even with the pain, even with the suffering, he had time for anybody that came over. He was a great listener. He gave good advice. He was always positive. Sometimes he'd commiserate with you, go, yeah, that's awful. Okay, now, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? You know, where's, where's the positive here and, and how are you going to live your life? And, and you know, that was wonderful. Uh, when I was divorced, I had two young daughters, and, you know, you have the issues with work and daycare and all that, and Lyle and Marilyn let my kids get off the bus. They'd do the homework with them, you know, and I'd get off work later, and I'd go over, and several nights a week, I'd just eat supper with them. When I say they invited us into their life, I mean they invited us into their life. Became almost honorary family members, celebrated birthdays, Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all those things together. And not just us, other people were invited. They extended family. They, they were, they had a love for people, a love for life. I also say Lyle was a deeply spiritual man. He believed in God. He lived with God. He communed with God. He took everything to God. And I remember one time after Mark had been in an accident in the military, and Lyle and I used to sit out around a bonfire, and we had gotten some cedar from a tree from a sawmill, and they were wide cedar planks. Okay, and we had great plans. If you knew Lyle, we always always had plans for projects, whether they come to fruition or not, you know. But had great plans for these boards. And we were sitting out around the fire and talking about that and, and praying and, and how grateful he was that Mark was okay. And it just seemed to be the natural thing to throw those on the altar. And and the idea was your best given back. And thanking God that Mark was okay. And I remember that night with Lyle, just just how he was communing with God that night. And that's the way he was. That's the way he lived his life. He was so happy. He gave his best to God and said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. You know... I'm reminded of Vince Gill's song. Uh, the words are, the, the title's escaping me, but part of the words are, Son, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven and shouting with love for the Father and the Son. I, I believe Lyle is running down the streets of gold. Yeah, shouting love for the Father and the Son. He lived it. But his work on earth is done. It continues, but his part is done. And what he's instilled in his family and his friends and everybody else continues. Mark, Andrew, and Daniel, you know, your dad's not here. But everything that he taught you is. And you've stepped up. You know, there's, there's, you've been promoted. And now you're the old men in the family. Now you're the fathers and the, the wise ones, the ones everybody else goes to because he's not here to go to anymore. And boy, he prepared you well, didn't he? That's the way it is. You know, the Bible talks about children being arrows in a quiver. You guys are some strong arrows. I'm proud to know you. This is almost the first time I've uh, spoken from a pulpit in a Methodist church. We did have, uh, shall we say, pulpit exchanges around Thanksgiving times where we do uh, a different thing in different places. Marilyn had asked me to give like two or three minutes, uh, and it's a little unusual. Uh, my relationship with Lyle was a little unusual. 
Uh, I had known Andrew and Daniel beforehand through the National Guard that we were in. I was the state chaplain at the time. And Lyle had asked me about uh, some of the Ashbury students that were there and could he use them as chaplains for a youth group. And I had to, I had to disagree with him and tell him no because of legal ramifications and things like that. And that led to other conversations, as you could imagine. Uh, one of the nice things about him was that when he found out that uh, there were certain things, because I was Catholic, I was not allowed into, he made certain that that was not going to be the case in his life. Uh, it also turned out that we had some good friends that were uh, the wife worked with Marilyn, the husband knew Lyle and stuff, and uh, we would get together and do things. I took Lyle into some Catholic activities, like took him to St. Minred Arch Abbey in southern Indiana just to see the architecture and things like that, and he had fun with it. I was one of those outside interests that would continue to excite him, <laughs> is what it boiled down to. Um, had connections with his mother because she had become Catholic, and then I could answer questions for Lyle about that. I would call him an evangelical Franciscan, and, and he would agree with me, and the more that he was reading about it, the more he agreed with it. He was never going to become a Catholic Franciscan, but that's okay. Evangelical Franciscan was, was fine with me and fine with him. The other aspect of it is because we had both had a love of history, uh, I did his father's funeral at his request uh, because of connections through the military and all that kind of thing. And we both had a very, very high security clearance because of our circumstances. So we could talk about some things that he couldn't, by law, talk about with others. And we could talk about them with the depth of theology that was appropriate for people who had been deep into ministry. And it was a good combination for both of us. The final thing I remember, just last uh, week ago Tuesday, uh, I, about every couple of months I'd get a chance to visit with him simply because I, I was pulled in too many directions. And I live an hour and a half away down in the Lake Cumberland area now, have three counties of churches, you know, so it's not quite planting, but the cultivating is a long reach at times and things like that. And I'm in a different time zone, so getting there and back was, was not always easy, and I looked forward to being with Lyle, but I couldn't always do it. And so, uh, but at, at first we, I'd take him out to, to lunch because I could get away with doing that, and Marilyn liked us to do that, things like that. Then it got to the point where it was easier to bring in Subway sandwiches, and Marilyn and I would each split a foot long, and Lyle got a whole foot long. And, and would save part of it, and he got peppers on his because he wanted a little bit of spice in his life. Not that marrying a redhead didn't give him a certain amount of that spice to start out with. Nevertheless, I will miss him because there are wonderful things that we could discuss in depth and in thoroughness, and yet I'd have to pull him back once in a while into those ideas. But we could discuss honorably and well in ways that couldn't be done in other ways. You will miss him too for similar and parallel reasons. But we will all know that he has been a gift to us from Almighty God. And today we give him back to God in honorable and beautiful ways. Eternal rest grant to you, my brother, and let perpetual light shine upon you. May you rest in peace and may your soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. It's an honor to have Father Dolan here. He's a faithful pastor to his people. And he is a faithful chaplain to our soldiers. And so we, we honor him. Thank you for coming today. Well, our 30 minutes are up. 
But I found in funerals and memorials, you're dealing with eternity rather than time. But I will be short. I, my life touched uh, Lyles in many ways. Army, Navy games, of course. Uh, he was so proud of his sons who all wore the uniform. I was sorry not one became a sailor. <laughs> but uh, God is a God of miracles. And Marilyn, he, he loved you. You were his golden nugget from Alaska. Yeah. And, and he really believed that you were this lady of Proverbs 31. He trusted you. Your lamp never went out at night, and I don't know how you did it over all the years, but you are certainly to be commended by God and all of us here. Uh, I'll have to say in my relationship to him, uh, I did struggle with why God called him to suffer for so many years and struggle. Now, he had good times. I don't mean it was all struggle. But, but why did God call him to bear that? It seems so hard. And my heart and soul was with him. And only as I thought about that in preparation for this day did I feel that God gave me an answer. And the answer was this. My own son bore the thorn in his flesh also. In his heart, first of all, because we sinned against him. And then, finally, in his hands and his feet and his side, we drove the thorns into him, and he bore them. And as our pastor here has referred to St. Paul, probably the greatest Christian who ever walked this earth, Paul said he was given a thorn as well. And he bore it. And then the Spirit showed me that neither Christ nor Paul were given those thorns because they had failed, or because they did something wrong, or there was some sin in their life or their family. The Spirit said that's not true. They bore those thorns vicariously, for others, that they might come to know Christ too and follow him. Friends, this is what the Spirit showed me in my relationship to Lyle. Thorns have a point, a spiritual point. And we all fail if we do not understand that as we look at his life and how God used him. The, the other thing the Spirit showed me was John's words in chapter 21 of Revelation. In heaven, the thorn is taken away. John said, I saw the holy city. I saw the holy God. I saw the holy people. And they were happy. And they were whole. And there was not a tear. Nobody was mourning or crying from pain. Because he who sat upon the throne said, I make all things new. And today, Lyle is new. Even though thorns have a point. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for bearing the thorns for us. Thank you for the thorn that Lyle bore for his family and for those he knew. 
and for friends he loved in his community. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for this man and for his dear wife and family. In your holy name, amen. Well, we have heard of Lyle's and read of Lyle's desire to fly away to Jesus and to run the streets of gold that are in heaven. And so we're going to sing a song that I imagine was one of his favorites. Uh, he wanted it sung at his funeral. Okay, so we're going to sing it now. I'll fly away. It's number 554. You can find it in the red hymnal underneath of a seat in front of you. I'll fly away. All of us will, those that believe and call Jesus Savior. Would you stand with me if you're able as we sing it? Like a bird from prison walls has flown, he has flown away, and he is in glory. Would you join me in silent prayer for the family as they, and the honorary pallbearers as they make their exit? Would you bow your head in prayer with me, please? Father, we have honored Lyle, and most of all, we have worshipped you, the one who he worshipped and adored. Would you keep this family in the palm of your good and gracious hands? Would you wrap your arms around them, hold them close to each other and close to yourself? In your good time, may they all be reunited again in that place that you have prepared for them. In Christ's name, amen. On behalf of the family, I thank you for coming today to worship God and honor Lyle. May the peace of Christ be upon us all until that grand and glorious day when we are all reunited again in his heavenly kingdom. Go in peace. Amen.